Good evening, um, my dear friends and colleagues. Today, inshallah, we will continue our discussion uh, for comprehensive clinical nephrology uh, textbook. Uh, we started our series by uh, introduction for glomerulonephritis, and uh, last video we talked about uh, minimally changing glomerulonephritis. Today, inshallah, we will talk about focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, very important topic in our practice. This is our agenda. Focal segmental glomerulosclerosis is a histological term that describes a certain histology in a light microscopy. As, uh, as all glomerular disease, it might be primary or idiopathic or secondary to various causes. And I cannot diagnose if a patient as having a primary FSGS only after exclusion of the secondary causes. Okay. What is meant by focal? Focal means that less than 50% of the whole glomeruli is affected. The whole glomeruli. While segmental means that only part of each glomerulus, only part or less than 50% of each glomerulus is affected. As this sclerosis progresses, it became more diffuse. Diffuse is, is, uh, means that more than 50% of the whole glomeruli is affected, while global is the opposite to segmental. At the level of each glomerulus, that more than 50% for each glomerulus is affected. In all types of FSGS, there is Budocyte affection. This is universal in FSGS. There is budocyte injury and budocyte affection. FSGS represents only a small percentage in nephrotic syndrome in young children. In young children, the most common cause of nephrotic is minimal change, more than 78%. But the second most common is FSGS. While in adult, this change because nephrotic FSGS in adult represent around 35% of cases. It, it is an important cause of nephrotic syndrome in adult and it is a poor prognosis. As a whole, FSGS is not a preferred uh, disease. So uh, FSGS, as we said, is an important cause of for in the stage in disease. It is of uh, poor prognosis, poor prognosis uh, uh, from uh, glomerular diseases. From it is not like many many change where uh, most of patients respond to steroids. This is different. In FSGS, the response uh, the response is much less than minimal change. What about the epidemiology? The primary FSGS is more common in males as an uh, as incidence, the incidence. And the prognosis even is worse in males uh, than females. The incidence of end stage renal disease secondary to focal segmental in males is 1.5 to 2 times higher than in females. So in males, there is a higher incidence and a bad, uh, more poor prognosis than in females. What is very important, very, very important that you shouldn't forget that focal segmental glomerular sclerosis is, is much higher, higher end of much more prognosis in African Americans. The most common cause of Nephrotic syndrome, the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in adult African American is focal segment. This is very important and this is a characteristic. Uh, it is believed that uh, this much higher incidence is due to mutation in the abolipoprotein L1 genes. Mutation in the abolipoprotein L1 genes. And it is not only an incidence, but it is about a prognosis. There is fourfold greater risk for end-stage disease 
in African Americans than whites. So in African Americans, it's much more common in FSGS and also of a much poor prognosis than whites. This is very important. And never to forget that the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in African American, adult African American is focal segment. And this is clear here. In children, as we uh, prescribe, this is focal segmental. In a children as a whole, uh, this is the prevalence of nephrotic syndrome, according to age variation. In a children, the most common cause is minimal change. But the second most common cause is FSGS, after minimal change. It represents a small percentage, but it is the second most common cause. What about the young adult? In young adult, never to forget. In black, in black, even if it is a young adult, focal segmental is the most common cause. Is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome. Is the most common one. While in white, it represents the third common cause after membranous and minimal change. So in black, it is the first, the most common cause, while in white, it is the third. What about in middle age and old age? In black, again, it is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in black, in young adult and in middle and old age. While in uh, white, it represents the third commonest cause after membranous and after minimally change like in young adult okay so in children it is the second most common cause in blacks either young adult and middle age it is the most common cause of nephrotic while in white population it is the third common cause of nephrotic syndrome after membranous and minimal change this is very important data that you should know what about the etiology and the pathogenesis as any glomerular disease, it might be primary or secondary. And causes include genetic causes or genetic mutation plays an important role in FSGS. We will talk about a circulating permeability factors in FSGS. Also, viral infections are a common uh, secondary cause for FSGS drugs main adaptive responses to uh, to a reduced number of functioning nephron and we will talk about these are all known or recognized causes for secondary FSGS what is universal in all forms of FSGS that there is bodocyte bodocyte affection and bodocyte injury this is a central pathogenetic mediator bodocyte injury is a must in focal segmental glomerular sclerosis that will lead to food process effacement and this will lead to bodocyte depletion. Bodocyte depletion. So there is bodocyte injury that will lead bodocyte depletion and this will increase the stress on the remaining or the adjacent bodocytes. There is injury to one bodocyte, this will lead to more work, more stress, more filtration more affection to the adjacent bodocytes. This will lead to propagation of the damage. There is more stress on the adjacent bodocyte. This will lead to more damage. And this injury will spread to the adjacent bodocyte by the increasing work and the increasing stress. This will continue until the entire glomerular lobule is affected. What about the secondary causes for uh, focal segmented, primary or idiopathic? There is, we will talk about uh, circulating and permeability factors suggested to play a role in FSGS. It's very important that you should know the secondary causes for focal segmented glomerular sclerosis, very important in your clinical life that you should exclude and in the exam, very common. Familial and genetic causes the most important is that there is mutation in nephrine 
in budosine nephrin budosine and alpha actinine transient receptor potential cation channel and very important to know that mutation in apolipoprotein L1 that's implicated in African Americans. Very important to know that. So the most common genes to be affected is nephrin, podocene, alpha actinine, TRBC10, and apolipoprotein. What about the viruses? FSGS uh, might be secondary to viral infections. The most common and the most important is, is HIV. Very important to know. HIV causing what's called collapsing nephropathy. Parvovirus is also an important cause for uh, FSGS. So don't forget HIV and parvovirus. Drugs, what about drugs? The most important is heroin, interferon, lithium, bamidronate, serolimus, and anabolic steroids and newer drugs, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Very important to know each one of them. This is very important. Drugs, heroin, interferon, lithium, bamidronate, the bisphosphonate, one of the bisphosphonates, serolimus, immature inhibitor, anabolic steroids. Very important to know, and we have seen many cases of, uh, uh, especially in uh, young uh, males, who uh, go to the gym and uh, take uh, anabolic steroids. We have seen many cases of secondary FSGS, secondary to anabolic steroid use, and tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Also, FSG, uh, secondary FSGS might be mediated by adaptive and structural and functional uh, responses, either as a response if there is a reduced renal mass or if there is a normal renal mass. In reduced renal mass, it is related to much more work on the remaining nephrons. As a stress we have been described, there is more, more affection to the remaining functioning uh, uh, nephron, like in very low birth weight persons, in reflux, reflux nephropathy, renal dysplasia, okay, or in surgical renal ablations, all of these, there is reduced renal mass. But if the patient have initially a normal renal mass, might be affected like in obesity, very important and you should know it, in obesity or overweight, sickle cell anemia, sickle cell anemia okay this is the most common uh, secondary causes for fsgs very important you have a secondary there is genetic nephrine bodocene alpha actinine apolipoprotein virus hiv parvovirus this is the most important drugs heroin interferon lithium bamidronate serolimus anabolic steroid tyrosine kinase inhibitors and uh, in reduced renal mass like in very low birth weight and reflux nephropathy or uh, renal uh, ablation, surgical uh, renal uh, removal, and in obesity and sickle cell uh, anemia. A very common scenario that we have seen in our uh, practice, that in patients with minimally changed disease who responded early to steroid therapy, but late and was diagnosed on biopsy as having minimally change, but leads they uh, have relapses. On repeated biopsy, they show that they have a renal biopsy shows FSGS. So primary, there is in biopsy, they are diagnosed as having minimally change and they respond to steroid, but later there is more frequent relapses and they became steroid resistant. On doing a repeated, by a repeat, when we repeat a biopsy, it reveals focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, and in some of them, this may indicate uh, uh, represent a sampling error because the affection in focal segmental glomerular sclerosis is patchy. That means that only uh, 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 small proportions of the kidney is affected early, early. So 
we might in renal biopsy talk from a non-affected area and it appears as having minimal change but actually they might they might uh, be a focal segmental growth curves from the start but they are falsely diagnosed as having minimal change so we consider minimal change and focal segmental glomerular sclerosis as podocytopathies because in both of them there is a fraction of podocyte. This is very important. Both in minimal change and FSGS, there is a suggestion that they are both caused by permeability factors or circulating permeability factors play a role in the pathogenesis of uh, minimal change and uh, FSGS. As we described in minimal change, that CD20, CD, uh, CD80, known as B71, CD80, and angiopoietin like 4 are suggested biomarker for minimal change, and they are uh, uh, excreted more in urine and serum of uh, patients with minimal change. But what about a focal segmental? Uh, the known marker or circulating factor is known as urokinase plasminogen activator receptor. Circulating, circulating, so far it is known as so far. Soluble urokinase plasminogen activator receptor. It is a, a suggested biomarker for FSGS. I have found that there is a higher level of SOPAR in uh, FSGS more than in minimal change or membranous. Also, in patients with recurrent FSGS, after transplantation, we have found that there is a higher, a high levels of support in uh, in the serum. Okay, but however, however, also a high levels of support have been found in patient with any kidney affection, irrespective of the underlying kidney disease because it increased with the deterioration of the GFR. So it is not specific. This SOBAR is not specific for focal segmental. So after many studies, the balance of evidence does not support, this is an important conclusion, the evidence does not support SOBAR as a specific is a specific and this is the important we need a marker that is specific for each glomerular disease this subar is not a specific mediator or a biomarker for fsgs this is the final conclusion and also the remaining biomarkers cd80 and cardiotrophin like cytokine 1 None of them, none of them, none of them have proved, have, have been proved as a specific biomarker for FSGS. In contrast to minimal change, proteinuria in focal segmental is non-selective, while the proteinuria in minimal change is selective. What about the genetic variants for focal segmental or genetic mutations? They will be discussed in details later, but many cases, many cases of primary FSGS have, have been identified as having a genetic mutation or polymorphism in genes, genes that play a role in bodocyte function and structure. In primary FSGS, this genetic predisposition by genetic mutations in the podocyte may underlying may underline it is the basic hit and and they need a second hit by either viral infections or obesity systemic hypertension or infectious diseases to became to manifest to be manifested later 
as obvious or full plume picture by FSGS. So they present a, pre a predisposing factor, a predisposing factor for having FSGS, and they need a second hit to be obvious. For example, genetic studies have defined that apolipoprotein L1 gene variant is a predisposing factor that encodes for apolipoprotein L1 is a major predisposing factor for in African American because this gene mutation of apolipoprotein we have uh, described it before is a predisposing factor for FSGS for HIV for hypertensive nephrosclerosis and the progressive lupus nephritis in African American studies prove that that this mutation in apolipoprotein 1 will is considered a major risk factor for HIV and hypertensive nephrosclerosis and FSGS and lupus nephritis in African Americans. What about the clinical manifestations? The incidence of nephrotic range proteinuria, which is the classic presentation of FSGS, is in a children is 70 to 90 percent. Nephrotic range proteinuria is present in children 70 to 90%, while in adult it is present in 50 to 70%. FSGS is mainly presented by nephrotic syndrome. And what is important to know that secondary FSGS, secondary forms of FSGS, typically have lower levels. This is important in our clinical practice. Lower levels of proteins and usually present by subnephrotic proteinuria and normal serum albumin. This is very important note that secondary causes of or secondary forms of FSGS is much more mild. They usually present a more milder presentation of FSGS, usually with subnephrotic proteinuria and normal serum albumin. Hypertension is found in 30 to 50, uh, 30 to uh, 65% of cases. Microhematuria might happen, and this is uh, important. Microhematuria, because most uh, considerable percentage of you usually exclude focal segmental glomerulus if the patient has microhematuria. No, microhematuria can happen in FSGS. This is important, and it is present in 30 to 70 percent, uh, percent of patients. Also, renal impairment might uh, be present in about 20 to 50 percent. So the most common presentation is nephrotic syndrome with nephrotic range of proteinuria, but also hypertension and microhematuria and renal impairment might happen with different. Uh, percentage. Proteinuria, as we said before, in FSG is usually non-selective. Very important, very, very important that the complement levels, complement levels, and the other serological tests are normal. This is very important in our clinical practice. Complement and serological tests are normal. In some patients, they might show glycosuria, amino aciduria, phosphaturia, indicating a tubular damage. A tubular damage. What about the diagnosis and differential diagnosis? Reaching a diagnosis for FSGS needs a renal biopsy. We cannot diagnose patient as having FSGS without a renal biopsy. Testing for uh, permeability factors, we have said that it is neither reliable, neither re reliable nor available in our routine clinical practice. We don't rely on these permeability factors. In children, in a children. The major differential diagnosis is minimal change. 
we have said that in many in children the most common cause is minimal change by about 78 or 80 percent and the second most common cause is uh, FSGS while in adult with sub sub nephrotic proteinuria the differential diagnosis is much more wider it might include all glomerular diseases while in adult with full plume picture of nephrotic syndrome the main differential diagnosis is membranous and minimal change we have said that in adult the most common cause in black the most common cause is fsgs while in white while in white, the most common cause is membranous followed by minimal change followed by focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. What we should exclude also, any all other glomerular uh, diseases that cause focal sclerosing lesions should be excluded, should be excluded, especially in chronic forms, in chronic forms. If we uh, establish the diagnosis of having FSGS, the second step is to, to know if it, this FSGS is primary or idiopathic or secondary. This is the second step. So the first step to diagnose FSGS, second step it is primary or secondary. In general, secondary causes, secondary causes or adaptive causes of FSGS usually have lower level of proteinuria, lower levels of hypoalbuminemia, and less degree of food process effacement renal biopsy. This is very important. So never to forget that secondary cause of FSGS is much more milder with subnephrotic proteinuria, less incidence of hypoalbuminemia, and much more lesser degrees of food process effacement. In patients presented with FSGS with an age of less than 25 years of age, genetic testing, genetic screening is important, especially if there is a family history of FSGS. We should screen for mutations in Bodocin, TRBC, alpha actinine, and inverted Furman. What about a pathology? There is variance, morphological variance for FSGS. So the variance or types of FSGS is very important. There is a not otherwise specified or the classical FSGS, very highler, cellular, collapsing variant, and tip variant. We have five, we have five types or five variants of SGS classic or not otherwise specified very highly cellular collapsing and tip variant and we will talk about each one of them now we will talk about each type or each variant of uh, fsgs we will start by the classic variant named uh, the classical fsgs or not otherwise specified it is the most common variant it is the most common variant and to diagnose uh, uh, not otherwise specified or the classic variant we need to exclude other variants uh, there are some characteristics in this classical form or uh, in not otherwise specified it's usually characterized by the, uh, there is more accumulation of extracellular matrix that lead to occlusion of the capillary of the capillaries so there is accumulation of extracellular matrix and usually there is more hyalinosis. Hyalinosis, uh, what is hyalinosis? Hyalinosis is plasmatic deposition or insudation of amorphous glassy material, of amorphous glassy material beneath a glomerular basement membrane. So it is characterized by accumulation of extracellular matrix that will lead to occlusion of uh, some capillaries and hyalinosis. And usually there is endocabillary foam cells and there is the wrinkling of glomerular basement membrane. You should know some uh, notes for each variant. Classic variant, not as well specified, it is the most common one, characterized by accumulation of extracellular matrix and more highly known. This is the light microscopy, characterized by increased ink, increased 
extracellular matrix and hyalinosus. This is the characteristic for uh, not otherwise specified variant. This is a light microscope. What about the immune fluorescence and electron microscopy? In immune fluorescence, there is usually there is deposition of IgM and C3 and sometimes C1Q. There is deposition in areas of sclerosis. In areas of sclerosis, and they are it is suggested that they are trapped. They are entrapped inside these areas of sclerosis. On electron microscopy, there is, as we said, there is increased in extracellular matrix, and there is wrinkling and retraction of the glomerular basement membrane. And what is characteristic is that there is no electron density deposits. No electron dense deposits. There is also, usually, there is budocyte detachment, and there is food process effacement with variable degrees. Food process effacement. And also, never to forget that this variant is the most common variant. So, in light microscopy, it is characterized by increased extracellular matrix and hyalinosis. In immune fluorescence, we might find some IgM and C3 and sometimes C1Q in areas of sclerosis. On electron microscopy, we found this increased matrix and there is some retraction of glomerular basement membrane and there is no electron dense deposits. This is the immune fluorescence in a classical form or classic variant. As we said here, there is some deposition of IgM in areas of sclerosis, in areas of sclerosis. What about a very higher variant? A very higher variant. What notes or what data we should know about a very higher variant? In very higher vi uh, variant, there is very higher hyalinosis and sclerosis. There is uh, El hyalinosis and the sclerosis are usually present at the vascular pool of the glomerulus, usually characterized by hyalinosis and the sclerosis that is more evident at the vascular pool. Vascular pool. Uh, also, we should know that very hyalur variant is very commonly present in secondary forms of FSGS. And usually there is uh, the glomeruli or there is glomerular hypertrophy and there is glomerio, glomerulomegaly. There is glomerular hypertrophy. So in very higher variant, it is a very common variant in secondary forms of FSGS. This affection by hyalinose and sclerose as you are usually more evident at the vascular pool of uh, vascular pool of the uh, glomerulus and there is glomerular hypertrophy. This is a picture by light microscopy. As we said here, it is more evident at the vascular pool of the, uh, of the glomerulus. And the glomerulus as a whole, there is hypertrophy. There is glomerulomegaly. And it is present in usually in secondary forms of FSGS. What about cellular variant? It is characterized by endocapillary hypercellularity. From its name, it is cellular. Cellular, there is cellular proliferation and endocapillary hypercellularity. And the glomerular capillaries are usually occluded by this hypercellularity. There is more proliferation of endothelial cells leading to occlusion of capillaries. Usually there is foam cells and infiltrating cells. Usually also there is oftenly there is hyperplasia of the visceral epithelial cells, visceral layer of Bowman's capsule. There is more proliferation and hyperplasia of the visceral layer of the epithelial cells. And food process effacement here is more severe in the cellular variant. So to conclude, 
in cellular variant from its name there is cellular proliferation there is hypercellularity in the endocapillary cells this proliferation will lead to occlusion of the uh, more occlusion to the glomerular capillaries usually there is more hyperplasia of the visceral epithelial cells and albudocyte effacement is usually more severe than other types as we said in uh, cellular variants there is endocapillary hypercellularity and there is that will lead to occlusion of capillaries as we say as we see here there is more occlusion there is occlusion some occlusion or partial occlusion of capillaries due to this hypercellularity in endocapillary cells that mimic a proliferative gm due to this hypercellularity and there is also hyperplasia and hypertrophy of the overlying visceral epithelial cells look here look here there is hyperplasia and proliferation of the visceral epithelial cells this is cellular variant what about the collapsing variant collapsing variant is uh, is characterized by the presence of collapse in the glomerulus there is collapse there is should be at least one glomerulus with segmental or global collapse in this uh, uh, glomerulus and usually there is occlusion of the uh, glomerular capillary lumen uh, the collapsing is usually is global than segmental in epithelial cells in epithelial cells usually there is intracytoplasmic protein resorption droplets so inside the epithelial cells a visceral layer of Bowman's capsule a visceral epithelial cells usually there is resorption droplets intracytoplasmic this will lead to these epithelial cells become very large and fill Bowman's space, forming what is called pseudocrescent. Pseudocrescent. It is not due to uh, proliferation of the uh, epithelial cells, but it is usually due to protein droplets inside these cells, intracytoplasmic. So there is collapse and there is uh, intracytoplasmic. Uh, uh, protein resorption droplets inside the epithelial cells also collapsing variant is characterized by severe tubular interstitial affection severe tubular interstitial affection uh, described as tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis also there is a very distinct feature of collapsing uh, uh, FSGS is the presence of dilated tubules forming what's called microcyst dilated tubules forming microcyst that contains a proteinaceous coast so there is more severe interstitial affection there is the dilated tubules forming microcyst on electron microscopy of course there is severe food process effacement this is a severe form collapsing variant is the most severe form of fsgs and it is usually this severe form this collapsing variant is usually caused by hiv uh, infection parvovirus parvovirus uh, b19 lupus budocytopathy hemophagocytic syndrome interferon tyrosine kinase inhibitors and bamidronate and you should know what are these are the common causes of collapsing fsgs this is very important in your life in clinical life and in exams very common uh, question hiv parvovirus lupus podocytopathy hemophagocytic interferon tyrosine kinase inhibitors and babitronate also another important note is the presence of tubular reticular inclusions very very important and very characteristic feature if there is tubular reticular inclusions in uh, electron microscopy it is you might be due to HIV and lupus and interfere you can be asked what are the causes of tubular reticular inclusions tubular reticular inclusions are usually due to HIV lupus and interfere look here 
there is collapse of the glomerular tuft. This is the glomerulus. What remains from it? There is collapse of the glomerulus. And all of these are in epithelial cells. Visceral epithelial cells, hypertrophied, hypertrophied, containing intracytoplasmic proteinaceous droplets. So there is collapse and there is a, a hypertrophy, hypertrophy of the visceral epithelial cells, as we described. Another picture shows there is collapse, collapse of the glomerular tuft, collapse, collapse, and outside in the Bauman's space there is hypertrophy of the visceral epithelial cells forming pseudocrescent pseudocrescent it is it is not an actual crescent pseudocrescent caused by this intracytoplasmic proteinaceous material it it appears that it's more hypertrophied another picture look here at the arrow this is the intracytoplasmic proteinaceous material present inside the visceral epithelial cells forming pseudocrescent again there is collapse in the glomerular tuft and here filling the Bowman's space or the visceral epithelial cells containing this proteinaceous material and enlarged enlarged and hypertrophied as we, we described this is a characteristic feature of F, collapsing fsgs that the tubules that the tubules show became microcyst containing a proteinaceous cost look here this is tubule containing proteinaceous cost also here here all these tubules present as microcysts containing a proteinaceous cost very characteristic feature of collapsing fsgs this is tubular reticular inclusions this is tubular reticular inclusions in fsgs it is here due to interferon it is called interferon footprint interferon this is very characteristic very important picture you should know can be asked about it tubular reticular inclusions regarding a tip variant here the affection involves the tip domain near affects the part of the glomerulus near the proximal tubule Characterized also by the, the presence of very high sclerosis. The presence of very high uh, sclerosis or collapsing uh, variants usually rules out TIV variant. TIV variant is characterized by the presence of affection or adhesion of sclerosis near next to the part of the glomerulus next to the proximal tubule. Usually the food process effacement here in the TIV variant is usually severe. Most of the cases are primary. Most of the cases uh, presented by TIB variant are primary. Like here. Near tubule. Near to you. This is the tip lesion. Adhesion to the tubular pool. What about the natural history and the prognosis? You sh we should know the risk factor for progression or poor prognostic factors in focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. Poor factors, poor prognostic factor include clinical clinical factors or clinical features 
histopathologic features and course of the disease during the course of the disease. The clinical feature if there is more nephrotic range proteinuria or more severe proteinuria, this is a poor prognostic factor. If there is renal impairment, this is a poor prognostic factor. Plaque race, of course, is a poor prognostic factor. We said it earlier in the lecture. Regarding the histopathology, collapsing variant is the most worst, is the worst one. And also the presence of tubular interstitial fibrosis is, a, uh, is of a poor prognosis. Failure to achieve to achieve partial or complete remission, of course, is also an poor, uh, is a poor prognostic factor. In general, outcome, this is very important. The outcome is best, what is of best prognosis, the tip variant. Of best prognosis in the tip variant and worst fame in collapsing variant. Of best prognosis, tip, the worst collapsing. Intermediate outcome, fee not otherwise specified. This is very important. This is confirmed by studies showing an incidence or a percentage of complete and partial remission. A percentage of remission was highest in tip variant lowest in collapsing a remission 76 percent in the variant and only 13 percent in collapsing with intermediate result in cellular and not otherwise specified this data this data is also confirmed but, uh, that the worst prognosis is in the collapsing variant by the incidence. The highest incidence of end stage renal disease was highest in the collapsing variant in 65% and lowest in the TIP variant with only 6% of cases with TIP variant reach reached the end stage and intermediate results for the cellular and not otherwise specified. Uh, to conclude, the best prognosis is in the TIP variant and worst prognosis in the, is in the collapsing variant. What about the treatment? And uh, treating FSGS treatment or guidelines from Kidigo guidelines, uh, Kidigo 2000, 2012, or even a uh, practice point which is published last year in 2020, are not different in FSGS. Regarding initial evaluation, it's very important to exclude secondary forms. This is very important because if we confirm it is secondary to any viral or drug, treatment is treatment of the cause. Genetic testing, genetic testing uh, is not routinely uh, performed, but only in a special situation. What about the initial treatment? The initial treatment of FSGS. Very important to note that steroids and immunosuppression considered only only in idiopathic forms, not in secondary uh, cases, only in idiopathic forms with full plum picture of nephrotic syndrome. Not all primary or idiopathic forms. Only steroids and immunosuppression are indicated in idiopathic forms or primary. FSGS with full plume picture of nephrotic syndrome. The first line therapy is steroids. Steroids should be given as, as a daily single dose of 1 mg per kg with a maximum of 80 mg or another regimen to give a steroid an alternate day dosing of 2 mg per kg with a maximum of 120 mg. This dose of steroids for initial uh, uh, period or initial treatment should con be continued for a minimum, a minimum of four weeks and a maximum of 16 weeks as tolerated or until complete remission have been achieved, which is earlier. 
يبقى وش duration of steroids minimum of four weeks maximum 16 weeks or until complete remission have been achieved which is earlier after that steroids should be tapered slowly over a period of six months this is very important يبقى to give uh, steroids as we described and then after complete remission or achieving that steroids should be tapered slowly over six weeks when to use CNI calcineurine inhibitors calcineurine inhibitors should be used in initial periods in patients with relative contraindications or intolerant to high dose of steroids like uncontrolled diabetes psychiatric conditions or severe osteoporosis but in patients with relative contraindication or intolerant to high dose steroid we can use calcineurine inhibitors treatment of relapse treatment for relapse for fsgs is treated as recommendation for relapsing minimal change in adult as the same regarding using the same regimen what about the steroid resistant fsgs for steroid resistant cases we uh, suggest using cyclosporin or cni cyclosporin or tacrolimus at a dose cyclosporin at a dose of 3 to 5 milligram per kg per day in two divided doses for at least four to six months if there is partial or complete remission to cni suggestion to continue cyclosporin treatment for at least 12 months followed by a slow tapering before steroid resistance cni cyclosporin or tacrolimus should be given for at least four to six months and if there is remission complete or partial we should continue for up to 12 months followed by uh, slow tapering in patients who don't tolerate in steroid resistant cases or don't tolerate cni they can be treated by a combination of mmf and high dose dexamethasone I suggested also an uh, uh, algorithm for treatment of FSGS. This is from Comprehensive. In patients with subnephrotic proteinuria, subnephrotic proteinuria without obvious symptoms, we should control blood pressure using ACE or ARBs and use statin and high protein, avoid high protein diet. While in patients with full blown picture, of nephrotic syndrome and symptomatic and high risk of complications we should give these supportive measures as above plus use of steroids does one milligram per kg per day or two milligram per kg uh, uh, on alternate days as we described for four to 16 weeks with subsequent dose tapering during short up to six months in a steroid resistant patients we can use the first line treatment is uh, calcium inhibitor cyclosporin or tacrolimus and while in patients who are, uh, have contraindication of, uh, to uh, CMI we can use MMF and dexamethasone. Rituximab have been used in some studies for treatment in patients of FSGS who became uh, dependent or who failed to respond and is more successful for steroid dependent rather than steroid resistant cases rituximab have shown some uh, positive data or favorable data in steroid dependent cases rather than steroid resistant abatacept also have shown some promising uh, results also good data uh, by the use of adrenocorticotrophic hormone have been beneficial in some uh, cases some few number of cases we have positive data about rituximab abatacept and adrenocorticotrophic hormone neither 
trying to prevent renal fibrosis the thinking in uh, while treating the FSGS but neither by rifinidine which is a tumor uh, transforming growth factor beta inhibitor nor a monoclonal antibody against transforming growth factor beta have proven safe or effective if, uh, and, uh, trying to prevent her fibrosis till now is not effective for patient to a second reform second reforms of FSGS the main target is to treat the underlying cause it should be the, the main entity of our treatment the role of immunosuppression haven't been proven in any forms of secondary uh, FSGS we shouldn't give immunosuppression for treatment of secondary focal segmental glomerulosclerosis what about transplantation very important to know that FSGS is one of the most common causes of recurrence after transplantation about 30 percent 30 percent very huge number of patients with primary FSGS who develop in the stage and underwent undergo renal transplantation develop recurrent recurrent FSGS in the allograft if a 30 percent from FSGS have recurrent uh, recurrence in the allograft very important and you should tell your, pa uh, your uh, patient about the higher risk of uh, recurrence in the allograft and you should take care while management with special precautions during preparation for uh, these patients for those patients who are at greater risk for that uh, for this recurrence children with early onset early onset of fsgs also severe forms or severe proteinuria those patients with rapid course to uh, renal failure and in united states and us white patients all are at greater risk a, a higher risk for recurrence in early patients with early onset with more severe forms with rapid course and white patients have are at greater risk for recurrence patients who lost a prior allograft due to recurrence at a very highest risk those patients are the highest risk for recurrence who lost a prior uh, a prior allograft to recurrent FSGS to summarize from Oxford FSGS might be a primary or secondary it is mainly related to a hyperfiltration injury primary FSGS as we described is more common in male than in female regarding the incidence and the prognosis more common in black with more severe forms it is usually related to mutation in the apolipoprotein L1 the main the main or is a universal feature in FSGS is podocyte injury it's characterized by also a recurrence after transplantation a mediator or uh, circulating factor main, the main one is the soluble form of urokinase receptor uh, is uh, suggested to play a role but it is not supported by uh, major studies clinical presentations is usually patient with uh, FSGS usually present by heavy uh, or full plumb picture of nephrotic syndrome but also might present with microscopic hematuria and hypertension and impaired kidney function and to remember that black patients usually present with severe forms investigations include serum creatinine smith gfr and hypoalbuminemia for and for all investigations of nephrotic syndrome the histology is characterized by focal which means that less than 50 percent of whole glomeruli is affected segmental that at the level of each glomerulus less than 50 percent is affected and then with more with more sclerosis it becomes diffuse and global immune staining usually no immune deposits but sometimes an igm with c3 become trapped in the sclerotic lesions electron microscopy reveal food process effacement uh, types or uh, variants of uh, fsgs classic variant was not otherwise specified 
and cellular variant characterized by endocapillary hypercellularity with capillary occlusion. A TIB variant usually present, present near the proximal uh, tubule is usually of the best of prognosis. Collapsing, collapsing variant is the worst one with the worst prognosis, usually uh, characterized by glomerular collapse. Usually present due to HIV, parvovirus, bisphosphonate, present by severe nephrotic syndrome or heavy nephrotic syndrome and rapid decline of renal function and high swan to cause end stage renal disease. A very higher variant, usually related to hyperfiltration and is usually present in secondary causes of. It is the most common variant to present in, in secondary forms of FSGS. In secondary forms of FSGS, it is usually very hyler, characterized by glomerulomegaly, glomerulomegaly, and a clinical picture, less severe, less proteinuria, and hypoalbuminemia is usually less, less proteinuria, and usually the albumin is not affected that much like primary cases. Secondary causes of uh, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis include familial with genetic infection, infections like the HIV or barf virus P19, drugs like bamidronate, lithium interferon, heroin, and serolimus. Uh, nephron mass reduction like renal dysplasia, reflux nephropathy, renovascular disease, or uh, nephrectomy. Hyperfiltration in case of morbid obesity, diabetic nephropathy, preeclampsia, sickle cell disease. In management, we should exclude secondary causes for FSGS. Poor prognostic factor, as we described, severe presentations, more progression of CKD, more progressive with renal impairment, interstitial fibrosis and histology, plaque race, no response or no remission, and the presence of collapsing variant is considered a very uh, poor prognosis. If nephrotic syndrome, if a nephrotic patient and patients with full plumb picture of nephrotic, spontaneous remission is uncommon and we usually we should start steroid therapy. As we described, we should start the initial therapy, include steroids, and if no response or in uh, if there is contraindication or in patient with intolerant to steroid, we should give calcineurine inhibitors calcineurine inhibitors and cyclosporin or uh, tacrolimus and in steroid resistant cases uh, we should give uh, calcineurine inhibitors and if there is no response to CNI we can use the MMF and high dose dexamethasone our sources and thank you inshallah to continue in the near future our lectures thank you